So we're going to talk a little bit, get back just for fun. We're going to look at angles. Like you can see with Chris Sell teaching, you've got to adjust to what his angles are. And if we watch, watch a swing and the attempt to make contact. That's fine. Where was that swing going? Watch the swing and the, and the angle of the pitch. Okay, so we look at plane of attack is that ball's coming here and his swing is going there. How much chance does he have for effective contact? Little. I mean, I've just got to hope I get there or not. This is something I actually saw the other night and I was lucky to you know, send me the video because it was, it was so obvious and visible from our vantage point that you realize. Now, what can we do to that hitter to help that out? Because one thing we never think about is angles. People talk about plane, but think about angles. The first thing we talk about is where's the release point? Where's the pitcher's release point? That's the that's key to me. Okay? Because a right hand on right hand release point is inside. So I want to make sure my release point is inside and I've got my vision on it. If you're facing Scherzer, what should I do? Adjust my whole setup. I don't change my setup. I adjust in a line, right? And here's a question, any left-hand hitters here? How come you guys can't hit lefties? Because you don't set up right. <laughs> okay, think about it. It's tough enough, but a left-hander, how many times do you think that ball's coming in from behind you? Is your, is your depth perception what it could be? No way. So then I realized, release points behind you. Adjust your stance open. Put that release point in here. And that works not only for lefty, because now you've got the field of vision. When that ball comes down from the left-hander, it's coming this way. It's not straight on. It doesn't do a magic loop to come straight on. So you can see where this is where it's going. So why aren't I getting in line with that? Remember we talked about Luis Ortiz talking about the highway, and I call it railroad tracks. Same thing. I'm going to adjust to that release point. Now if I adjust our release point, I see the ball better, and I can get a better swing off in that angle. So literally, I'm not changing my setup, I'm changing my position in the box. Side armor, change position in the box. Now as left-hander, pitching against right-hander, has any righties ever felt like a lefty could throw a fastball under your hands? I felt that way, because he could. <laughs> Look at the angle. It's not much different than the angle you saw left on left. So to correct that, what do I do? Now, if you also look, it puts my head supported, balanced, both eyes on what? Release point. And that release point is bringing everything into this position, rather than me trying to adjust my head or body to see, which changes my setup, and puts me in, in a compromised position to be able to hit in line. So play with trying to play with that from a point of how you guys can see the ball, because I don't believe on the lefty lefty just being some, you know, weird coincidence life. I think it's just tough to see. And then if it's tough to see, can you get a good swing off? Yeah, so again, talking about angles. So we look a lot at, you know, you can hear, like I said, setups are really important. So my setup has got to allow me to move in balance, get to good position, and from there, I think the chance of me getting off good swing is really much better. But it's also predicated on me trying to also have the vision that if I'm not seeing the ball well, if I have to fight to see it, what's happening inside? Distraction, tension, whether I'm conscious or not, you know, not seeing the ball is not a good thing. And when I have to strain to see the ball, I guarantee you I'm not loose and relaxed. So there's all these little pieces that may seem intangible and we can put a lot together by being comfortable and knowing that I'm sighting in, I can get both eyes on the ball without a dog fight. You know, and again, pitches are in here in my line rather than cross angles to my body. As you can see with that one, I don't know if that, that kid never had a shot to get to that pitch. That ball's coming here and his swing was going here across a cross plane. It was almost perpendicular. And then you kind of like, okay, so. How do we fix that, right? So now the other thing is, we're talking about being beat. Do you think he thought he was beat? 
Oh yeah, you're facing Chris Sale. That might be some of the filthiest stuff you see. But what's the body want to do anytime it panics? <coughs> so one of the things we like to do is play games that the kids can do, or the players. One we do is called chaos. Okay, chaos is really simple. It starts with flips. And what we do a lot in flips here is I give a verbal go. For many years we were taught when a guy brings back his hand for a flip, that's when we go. I want you to go earlier than that, so we give a go and then. Because I want a hitter getting used to being on the way without actually seeing something because we don't pick up the ball until later. So getting that idea of kind of controlling my move forward. So we have the, the we call the verbal. We also do it while we're doing slider of velocity machine. Chaos is after it keeps his better. You get him set, now he closes his eyes. He's not allowed to open his eyes until he's going forward with the go. So he'll hear the go and now it's on. And what that does, the first couple times you do that, you'd be surprised to panic, right? But then they start slowing it down, okay? Because we're freaking out, we can't see, and now we gotta go do something. So suddenly in a little bit, they get better at it. So the minute they get better at doing it in flips or front toss, guess what you do? Slider machine, right? And once again, you realize everything the mind does, everything the body does from like panic, is matter just like, hey, we're okay. But understanding that we got all the time in the world to be where we need to be, but it plays a, it, it's, it's a mind game. And they get used to it. And so it's like, okay, I'm all right. Then once they start hitting, then they go back to hitting regular, and like, oh my God, what a difference. It's not a, it's a very small thing, but man, it makes a big difference. You wanna do it? Yeah, who wants to, who wants to be the uh, chaos guy? Go. Go. Your left arm's clipping, feel it? Go. What's the first move? Huh? What was your first move? Front side move. Yeah, relax. Back side. Go. No better. Go. Okay, so now we're just going to tell you you're going to shut your eyes and you make your first move when you hear that magic word. Go. How weird did that feel? How weird. Go. Go. That was really weird, huh? So you could actually cheat the hitter because you can see that I blew him up. So do you see the first panic? What we have to learn to do in this drill is we can do dirty things like that, but it's a matter of like trying to reduce that panic moment. Ready? Here we go again. Go. 90% of it is just going to be regular timing. Go. Go. Look okay, at regular, open eyes. You can open your eyes now, you're on regular. Go. Go. Okay, what was the difference once when, when you opened your eyes on those last two? Yeah. So then we'll get to a point maybe where the guys feel more comfortable and just trying to get your body and mind and eyes to work on kind of pulling the space together. I'm not a fan of short velocity where a guy will set up at you know, 35 feet and try to throw 80 miles an hour at you. We need that 60 feet. We need that, that, that distance to try and pull it together. Um, so the next round, depending on where the hitter's at, we'll you know, miss a few more and then we'll call contact. And contact can be miss, foul ball, clip, anything, foul tip. We're not really even worried about the result. When you're saying miss in that first round, you say miss intentionally? Miss. Swing and miss. So uh, swing and miss. Not swing it's miss. okay to miss. It's okay to miss. I mean, you're just following your line. That's oh, a good swing. You know, just trying to feel your cadence. How's everything feeling? You know, keeping that rhythm, gotcha. but making sure you've got, you're not breaking down. Because the first thing you're trying to do is usually, if you miss the first ball, you're trying to do anything you can to hit the next ball. Now on Apple Watch. <laughs> she does that every time. Now, yeah, it's miss. Get comfortable missing. 
you know, and then we call it the eyewash mess too. And um, you'll understand, like I said, if I'm in a game and you throw me a filthy pitch and I take a good swing and I'm all over it but I miss, we've talked about that, you're not going to throw me that pitch again. High level game, you're not throwing me that pitch again. Because the catcher said, whew, he was all over that. Catchers have a great perception and view of this game. And Toby, guy just misses a good slider. You going to throw it to him again? No, we're going. Yeah, you're not going to throw it for a strike, that's for sure. Higher level of game, I'm eliminating that pitch. <clears throat> okay? It's not going to get thrown for a strike. And if, you know what I'm saying? But the same thing, I've still got to get a good swing at it. Um, and then, like I said, before long, after you know, foul tips, clips, the guys will start actually making pretty decent contact. Okay? That might be it for that day. Because, I mean, you've gone through it. Go ahead. Doug, so you're going, you're, you're in line, best swing, miss, and yes. then you, the second round would be? It De might depend on where they're at. Okay. So, I mean, I might have a full day of misses. Just okay. to try to get them? Yeah, just to feel them maintain, maintain the rhythm and cadence and not breaking down and trying to direct control. Because maybe we do that, we're hitting a small zone. But invariably, very quickly, they do wind up in a con. There'll be times they're swinging and missing, and guess what they're doing? Well, damn, I hit that ball, sorry. Right? Because now the thought is now getting off the swing, which is what we want. But traditionally, what will happen in time is that before long, they start hitting that ball, even at high velocity. Um, we used to do another variation where we'd move back to the plate, um, where people were moved up. We'd start plate number one. I'm not even in line with the pitch, and I'm just feeling the miss. Then too, but what I started thinking about is I really want to generate that same vision. So even if I'm up four feet, that's a different visual dynamic than it is for me being, you know, at 55 feet of re re release to plate. So I said, let's just keep it there. Let's just miss, you know. But I want to demystify the miss too, you know. But I want to see for me the, the idea we talked about a good miss is the hitter's body is going here. I really don't want to see hitter's bodies coming around the zone. I want more in that, that direction, more in that, that, that highway. Um, same thing with sliders. Um, uh, Jeff and I were talking about one of his players, um, and he missed 40 sliders, and we are throwing a plus slider. I mean, a Chris Sell slider. Filthy, you know? Uh, we saw it yesterday. Uh, who was in here? Yeah, we, we saw it yesterday. It was filthy. But guys wind up, even a kid can wind up after you miss it, you're on it, suddenly you start seeing contact. And remember, man, I can hit that. Because there's times, the first time you look in that, you're just like, oh, there's no way. You get that thing humming at 100 miles an hour, you're just like, no way, no how. It's like, whew. But then you realize suddenly, that slows the game down because now you get in rhythm with that. So the thing that doesn't work is because practice, you guys don't have the time. But that's something you can set up with these guys to be able to do on a pretty routine basis. And I asked through it on a mat. So you guys come in September, October, and they're going out a couple of nights a week, hitting, and they're doing you know velocity training like that. Is that going to be a bad thing? Because the other thing is they've got the confidence. Later on, it's like, oh, I can do this. <coughs> you know. Yes, sir. Matt and I were talking earlier, and this was a question that that we have with our limited time in the fall, and I'm, most of us have that problem, of when we're trying to change different motor patterns, when do we start to stress them with velocity? Or Late. the slider? Late. The most stroke. important thing with the movement pattern is the movement pattern. And I'm looking at, like I said, higher level players are going to have to be competing. Um, and the, the tough thing is, here's if the DNA of every hitter is different. Changing movement pattern of hitter A and hitter B two different dynamics. But that's why I look at the first thing we start doing, I think in an ideal world, is get in there, work on balance. Um, we've talked about the ability, we talked a lot about how the back leg controls the move forward. And the funny thing is, every one of us, every one of us that's ever played baseball, <coughs> inherently knows how to control that. Because if I put a ball in my hand, and I, I'm gonna throw in slow motion, I control that with my back leg, because that's what we've always done. Now put it back in my hands and it's completely different. Don't ask me why, there might be other factors, but we know how to control that move. So the thing we have to do is be able to use the back leg to control our move and maintain it. Because the key is I want to get here and now have it to deliver. 
And that, I think, is the biggest thing we have to face because, as I was telling Coach Milkovich, based on what I've seen over these years, balance is not normal to hitters anymore. We've talked about, you know, hip angles and the pelvis being, you know, ready to pedestal and being in a, in a bad position because it gets to be normal for them. And based on the swings that they've tried to ingrain or coffee or whatever the case may be, they just get, they don't have a good feeling for the idea of balance. And that's my idea when I tell somebody, as wide as I want to get, I can move without back shifting. But the wider you get for most hitters, they're going to back shift because this is an easy move. So guys that widen up hitters, I start throwing things at them. And I've heard guys say, widen up with two strikes. Oh great, it's bad enough I got two strikes, now you're making me less athletic and slow. That makes no sense. You know, I'm, I'm here to do damage every time I swing a bat. I'm not saying do damage from the standpoint of hit a run, but get good contact at the ball. So again, for the most part, if you know how to use your body, you can be wide and move. There's a, there's a drawback there, but I still can get to a good position. But you'll find most people, when you tell them how to move, they're going to they're gonna be a little bit of a back shift. It was told to me that it's almost impossible for people not to back shift. I disagree. We've done our whole lives throwing. None of us back shifts to throw. But again, the key is everything we can do to create a position where I can just move forward under control. Now, the one thing you can say, you can't hear my front foot coming down very loud because it's coming down here. But hear the difference? Harder move, front side move. So the first thing we have to do is try to kind of work elements of balance. Is it going to be perfect day one? No. Some guys will get it fast, most won't. So in order to start making better hitters, we've got to rethink how we're going to train balance. That's what we talk about carrying the weight. There's lots of other little things we do trying to excite the back leg into control. Um, challenges for hitting coaches. How many have righty, lefty hitters? Righty throw, lefty. We call them righty lefties, right? And then on the odd case, sometimes you wind up with a lefty righty. But that puts their dominant side in the front, their weak side where? On the back. So already we're working at a disadvantage because that back side that's weaker doesn't want to work the same way that the front side will work. So right away they have more work to do in just trying to create the right backside move because it's not normal to them to have that leg in control. And further, we talk about the front side move being bad, the righty lefty or the lefty righty, the front side wants to control everything. And that's where you see the dead arm a lot. And a dead arm is when you see a swing and the, the back arm is just kind of not doing anything. It's kind of following because it's following the move of that front side. But once again, they get to do extra work. They chose hit righty lefty, okay do the extra work. And that means gym work, one-legged work. We have all sorts of torturous drills we put these guys through. But I'm saying 90% of what we do to be a good hitter is not swinging a bat. Because there's a lot of time we can spend finding how we, how we need to move. You know, however it is. However it is I want to move, I got to find that. Some of the things we talked about in moves of balance, because I've always, remember, I got a bias, what is it? Balance, okay? What should your front foot do when you make a move? Your front foot should actually think it's coming up underneath your front hip. Everybody stand up a second, no feel this. Yeah. So, as we're in a position of balance, what we're gonna do is we're just going to use our, if you're lefty, righty, whatever, we're just gonna step forward to balance, ready? Step forward to balance, okay? Now, what did most people do? Watch my front foot. They step forward, right? Okay, so here's what I'm saying the little trick is. I want you to pick your foot up underneath your hip first and then step. So pick your foot right up underneath and then step. You say your whole body just moved better? Okay, so we're talking about coming up underneath to then make my move. A lot simpler because <coughs> it takes up the body rather than it creates basically what we call modified reach. Okay? So now you can see where guys that, you know, there's a lot, a lot of people like to kick now, right? Now you're going to find this stuff to believe. I do not teach people to kick. But I will tell you, I think the kick is the most natural athletic move we make as a hitter. Ask me why I believe that. Why do you believe that? 
because I watch hitters get to a position and they start feeling real comfortable at balance, suddenly you start seeing this. It just comes out of nowhere. <clears throat> because I think when you think about what we're trying to do in a move, I think that's how the body actually self-organizes to that. But there's a lot of people then try to create a kick, but they do it wrong. They get back shifts or anything else. Or, remember we just talked about lift up underneath? Where am I going? So when you see that foot and that leg and that knee, the shin, away from balance, I can't survive that because I have to reach away from that. Oregon State's catcher. Right. Okay. He comes under, but he's got an under move first. So there's a, it's like a, what we call the diagonal kick, but he's under and he comes to balance. But if I'm in the wrong position, see if that's a pedestal, see the difference in my body. So his shift here allows him to work better. And it impressed me because I read where he talked about changing his own swing. And he talked about the one thing he saw about good hitters was being on time in a good position. That's what it's like, being on time in a good position. <clears throat> you talked too about the body works in X's. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've I found accidentally a few years ago to get guys to that move of why the leg lift is so natural for guys. And I, I think it actually helps guys who are opposite handed, so mm -hmm. swing opposite their, their dominant three hand, is to tell them to try and go dunk. You watch guys who you just say, hey, just go, go try and touch the ram or grab it or dunk or whatever, is they do that move. They, they compress together, right, and they get to balance point. Nobody pedestals when you're trying to dunk no. two feet, right? Everybody gets up and they, they, you compress together and explode out. And we, we started to just do that as a, as a warm up thing. And, and it really helped guys find their, their center of gravity and their explosive core there. And it's funny because we talk about. Think about it. Balance seems like a really relatively simple idea. But a lot of guys don't know where the balance is. And it, it, balance can be trained. But in some cases, like I said, we have so many things that are built into us, hit or even I've seen uh, defensive uh, treatments where guys get doing that. It's like, man, that's out of balance. And if I've got to reset my balance to make a play, then I'm all over the place. So I've got to stay my body has to be working in concert and together. But again, there's these things you find for each player. What's that thing that warms up his body and gets him in the right place? And it may not even, like, so be swing, but get it going. The, um, you know, the triggers, mirrors, huge, huge. Because a lot of people can't tell when they stand up, they'll sit down and say, your left shoulder or your shoulder downhill. Like, really? And a man. I feel like I'm uphill. Well, of course you feel like you're uphill because your body wants to be here. So if we see this, where's the culprit? Watch this. But what does everybody do when they're here? They try to lift the shoulder up, which actually counterloads the side. The actual culprit is where? That other, the little side of the X. So a lot of times it's just finding how to find balance. That's why I said, so a lot of the gym training not just you know get, get strong, get balanced. Anything they can do in balance, you know, and learn. Like a lot of times, I'll take a hitter and uh, squat. Doug, come on up. Okay. So get in a semi stance. Okay. Squat. Are you centered? A little bit went down. Right? Okay. Come on back up and maintain the squat. So what you try to do is try to find a guy and watch him carefully. Because a lot of guys you say, okay, squat, right? Now squat down, you center it, right? And then you see this. See where I just went? So it's like, oh, got to maintain the squat. So sometimes you got to bring them up and then, okay, hold right there. And then I ask them, man, what's your body want to do? And they're like, Doug, man, my, my body wants to go back there. So you have to reteach balance. So then I'll make a move. Okay, make a move to the 50 50. Squat again. Okay? Continually moves, set up, baby squat up, over to 50-50, squat again. Just trying to get that patterning going. I want you guys to come up with even better ideas. Jumps, I like that, you know? But we've got to re, we have to re-educate balance. It's not natural to hitters anymore. A lot of that is, like I said, I think it's been trained out of us. You know, without, particularly guys, anybody that's been a spinner, 
And clearly the concept, a lot of people talk about <coughs> linear versus rotation. If you ask me if it's linear or rotation, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm shutting you off. Because there's not two ways. And people have told me, well, you don't, you don't teach rotation. But yes, I do. I'm like, what? You're linear. I said, no. There's only one movement for the body. I don't teach spin, though. So the difference is, this is spin. And if you see every bit of my body, if I do it with my shoulders, I do it with my hips, where am I going? Where are my planes of attack going? Wrong place. I got no coverage when I'm going here. What are my, what are my hands going to do? Are they free or are they locked? They're locked. Anytime I have a shoulder move, I have no freedom. Okay? And even the big ones we see now where kids are doing the, this kind of move, where people think, well, that's how you get under the ball. No, that's how you get out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I have no, I mean, I, I, it's tough for me to really grasp what they're really trying to do. Because I look at a game, I'm like, I don't know how they can uh, think they're going to have success. Because, okay, if, let's say they can time up a fastball. You think that's the way I'm throwing anything but that? Good luck. Where are you going? Plus, the other thing is, where's my vision going? Okay? So we want to see, as I said, levels. Try to see as <coughs> levels we can when we start. I really am not happy with this move because you think this move actually predicated other moves as I'm switching that I'm really never in balance. But as balanced as I can to then fire underneath. And if I can, I want to think about what this whole segment here is doing. Because we talked earlier, the minute this happens, good things are going to come. Because when I bring hand, forearm, elbow together, I automatically pick up the backside. This backside is just built right in. If I miss as I spin, you see I miss my point? I'm here. So all I can do is manipulate, and I don't have a backside. I'm coming off my backside. I want that backside behind me. I want that backside working. So a lot of people talk about the elbow return. I'm all for an elbow return. But I watch with hitters, you've got to be careful how your terms work. You've got 10 different guys, you're going to do a 10 different. Some guys say, I want to get my elbow in. Good. Is that good? Good. But then there's a lot of guys get their elbow in and suddenly it's here. See the difference? Not good. So then you show a guy, okay, get your hands in. Good. Right? Then you get a guy, get your hands in. Bad. So I kind of cheat and I try to use the form as a basis. Just if I can get this feel, if I get this, I'm probably pretty good. And that's where we talk about working underneath the front elbow. See where I'm at? Here. Because we were talking with Neil earlier about elbow position and watching what that does in front side contact, what it can mean. But if I'm under here, lots of good things are going to happen in my swing. That little move there can clean up a lot of path. But the problem being, what position I'm in dictates whether I can even do that. So I challenge anybody to spin or try to get the hips out of the way and watch this, just, it's done. And you'll see the elbow gets stuck here and all you've got is a push. So I really want to kind of create that feeling of this easy dynamic, hand and elbow, whatever works for the hitter. I mean, some, sometimes we've got to come up with really creative nomenclature for that particular hitter. But the idea is you're going to see it and go, okay, whatever that was, keep doing it. You know? All right? Once again, we'll go back to our friend, the back heel, inside part of the back heel. Okay? We really want to feel the inside part of my back heel. Okay? Boom. Well, because most of us are inclined to do what? Particularly if I'm not in a good position of balance, lower half, I want to go to the balls of my feet. If I go to the balls of my feet, I'm running into the danger zone. All right, we're going to talk about APT in a second. If I go over here, I don't have legs. So what's the only thing I can accomplish now? I have to go with the upper body. If I go with the upper body, guess what it's going to be? Front side move. And I might run into some balls, but I don't have that key one we want, consistency. And if I don't have control of my posture, if I break posture, how much adjustability do I have? I don't. I can just go. You know, <coughs> coaches, we've all seen slider, uh-oh, right? Breaking ball, firewood. There's no way I can get off a good swing. So we talk about posture as an effect of how the hitter sets up from the feet 
to the hips and up. Um, we recently put something out, we talked about the pelvis tuck. Anybody with martial arts? Or something called the horse position. And it's pretty simple, I just tuck underneath. That's a very strong position for my body to be in. Now when I tuck, I also then place my body in there, and now I carry a lot better because I'm in a good position. Most people get kind of like we call high glute, and I'm kind of unwieldy, see where I want to move? But if I go here, I settle in better. The biggest plus is um, APT is something called anterior pelvic tilt. And it's essentially, when we get to the wrong position, our legs are gone. We don't have legs. And I'm glad there's a technical term for it, because I've been saying for years, you do that, no legs. You're off, you're just spinning. You, it's really inefficient move. And you're gonna see a lot of hitters going into that. The best thing you got for that is, make sure you pitch your coach knows. <laughs> All right, because that guy's gonna hit in a zone about that big. The only thing he's gonna hit is an accident. But again, to be able to stay in my base, to stay in my base, I got to stay in my hips, move in posture, and then work. Uh, some conventional people think that, I um, mean, we've all seen it, what we call the S, where the hips seem farther ahead than, than the shoulders. And some people like that, I do not. Because of my balance, where does my body want to go? Okay? So I challenge you, fill these different positions yourself. Feel what muscles are firing, feel which muscles are arguing. Can I be clean from here? Can I work under really well? No, because I'm, and people talk about what's that term, disassociation or something like that. I, I don't get it. I want to be complete, I want to fire all of this there. I want all of this working for me as, as many times as I swing it back. But if I get in here and I twist, I'm not going to be supported. And I'm going to be coming around balls rather than through them. You're gonna just, you know, pick up. Ready? Just pick up with your knee. All right. Now what I want you to do is pick up at the very bottom of your foot. Which one is easier? Pick the bottom of your foot up. See the knee? I lose the foot. So it becomes a really hard move. But if I just pick up the bottom of my foot, it takes me, keeps me all together. So that whole pickup idea is picking them up under. Let it happen from the bottom of the foot. You know, like when people try to learn a kick, what do they try to kick with? The knee, rather than the foot. So again, work from the bottom up. So I want to bring that foot up, and whatever it wants to do, but fine. If I get here, then I can move forward, and I can pretty much maintain my posture. Is my posture going to change a little bit? Yeah. I've got a good safety margin. Okay? Now, one of the other elements of balance is every hitter is different. There are hitters that are tall, and then there's hitters that are bent over, their hitters are like this, whatever the case may be. Here's a rule, or a very strong idea. Shin angle equals spine angle. That's when your body wants to balance. So if my shin's bend this much, and I bend my spine, so I'm balanced again. Feel it. Match your shin angle to your spine angle. Feel the balance change? Okay, now, go to a shin angle without a spine angle. Feel the fight? Yeah. Okay. So you'll see hitters sometimes will do little things, but come into their, their movement. But at a certain point, I've got to get to my best possible position to move in balance. We also have, uh, there's a term that you call hinging. Um, not sure what I can say about that. There's a lot of weird terms out there that I don't understand. But... A hitter can't make a move here because what's that going to cause? APT, anterior pelvic tilt, right? But a hitter can go into that same move here. See how I compress a little bit? But it's under control. And the most important thing is now we're going to then space. What do I have here now? Space. So all of our moves based on getting us to a good position and leaving space for what? AP. <coughs> Um, we have a little bit of space behind us. And I talk about, I've talked a lot about we don't need a lot of space behind us. Okay? And I've said before, we can do devastating damage from here. Devastating. And at big league level, we can do damage. Because we're already at the top of the zone. The only move now is to get the backside through. 
And some guys say, well, look at trout up here. It's like, I don't even respond to that. Yeah, the, the absent, I don't need as much space. I remember the old days, the big moves, the big loads, big separations. Okay, what's that going to do now? Okay, what happens to balance the minute we make a big move? Nice catch back there, I saw that. The, uh, do you think big moves, lots of movement going on, but where am I putting my body? What position is my body in now? Compromise. So from that point, once I'm in a compromised position, am I going to get off an effective swing, an efficient swing, or it's whatever I can come up with? So I look at big moves out of balance, cannot happen, and where's balance at? So if you watch good hitters that look like they have big moves, their moves happen as they go forward, so it's within balance. They don't load back and then try to carry. It's all a completely different move. So we always talk about maintaining everything within balance and being able to carry that. So as moving in balance, I also think about space. Okay, and here's my, my, my key space. A little bit of space here, but I want space here. Why? Because that's where I'm gonna fire, right through space. All I have to do is maintain that space and I've got every pitch on the plate. And that's a tough one for kids to conceptualize that I can hit that ball from here. And invariably, though early on they'll start really hitting the inside middle pitch good, but the minute, the minute you go away at the ball, what do they want to do? They want to articulate the barrel until I get the barrel. They'd rather know, no, you can stay right there and get that. <laughs> because suddenly their minds go, I can't do that. I've got to go around and get the ball because they're all used to articulating the barrel. But if I can get in here, if I can get in here, I can drive through that ball with the same move, with very little change in the hand position. Is it gonna happen? Yeah, but it's not gonna be casting out or coming around the ball. So a lot of the work you're gonna do is working under space. Just being able to feel the idea of just working under space. So far so good? But where, where are the hands going to be? Here's the thing, where usually where when you get hitters, you know, like, where are my hands supposed to be? I don't know, you can, sometimes I have to let them find them. Now that's one thing I do cheat a lot, is I do drop hands. But there's one good reason I drop hands. Space depends on how you fire, but we're not going to be we're not going to be up because I'm in my shoulders. So I want to drop you out of your shoulders. And yes, there are hitters that are up and drop, and that's fine. But there's a complicated move too. There are complicated moves in there that, as long as you get them right, and there's guys who can make these moves, but they may, may not be as natural to you. And that's why hitters are such copycats, right? They're going to copy what's hot, but the key is what works best within your framework. You know, and the thing about where the hand position is going to be is where do you, where are they easiest to fire? Some guys there's going to be a tight tight zone, but a hitter kind of has to find that. But more importantly, how are the hands holding the bat and where are we at? So we've talked a little bit about just even little positions, but if my hand's here, I have to come off the ball. If I see a hitter's hands here, he's going to come off the ball. He cannot maintain a line because if my body's like this. This is a grind, it wants to go this way, that's where it's going to go. So what I have to do is have my variant where I can just go here. Okay? So if I'm in here, I'm good. Every here is a little bit different. Here might be good, but here might be the death knell. But again, just the bottom hand position can take me off the ball. Because that's the way the body works. And the top hand, eventually when we get to our, our position where we're going to launch the ball, we should be in a position where we can just bring it right in. There should be no fight. But if my hand's in the wrong position, uh, where am I going to go? Uh, you know, and again, people look at starting points. There are certain people that kind of starting point looks like this. But if you watch when they get to the launch position, here they are to be able to work under. We have to be able to get here. If I make any move from the start that's not here, I'm going to be compensating. So it's find each point where each hitter is loose and easy. I use a lot of finger pointing. Because generally, if my fingers are pointing this way, they're probably in a good position to work under and just make that move. And you see, when I go under, I'm not even worried about what that barrel's doing. Because if I become aware, if I lose the barrel because I can feel it early, I'm in trouble. Now, we know the concept of dumping the barrel. And for the record, I don't want a barrel, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> Have you guys seen that? I've seen that. We've shown that. I don't know how you expect to hit a ball. I don't, I don't understand. It, it's beyond me. My body says, no, please don't do that. So I'll pay attention to my body. But if I can get in here, 
and I get in here, pick up my backside, now from this point forward I have nothing but adjustability. And if I've got that adjustability in this line, I'm going to handle just about anything you can throw at me based on timing. But here's a good thing on My timing doesn't have to be critical mass because I've got that line. So even if I think I'm a little late, if I think I'm a little late, if I'm here, I can still have a great outcome. But if I go to that front side, and I start grinding. And then I grind slow, and the only thing I possibly do is try to articulate the barrel because it's basically self-defense. That's all I've got. And God forbid I can't hold up. I, can you can you clarify articulate the barrel? I think I know for context, but I just want to hear it in case I miss it. Articulate the barrel was when people were trying to control the barrel from board go. And I'm going to get get the barrel there, you know, whether it be inside or outside. Trying, trying to make sure, and you'll see them shorten up. And I call alligator arm. I'm trying to control the barrel because they're trying to get from point. They're trying to do something here. The worst I see is uh, anytime I see this happen in a swing, there's no bat speed going to be involved, and there's no adjustability. Once we're here, got to come around. And that's probably a high percentage of young hitters. Um, high percentage. You know, and that could be just from two things. Bad mechanics and movements correlated with bad thought. I gotta get the barrel to the ball. If you looked at these, you know, you'll see these little kids in a second doing the exact same thing. That's where bad things begin, this big. You know, so they're already starting graining bad movements. And it's not bad movements because I, Doug Ladd says so it's bad movements because that's not how our body is efficient. So that's why I said, this is about efficient and strong body moves. And the other thing I say with younger hitters, or even older hitters, the minute I lose this back here, I'm dealing with the weight of this barrel. I don't care if I weigh 240 pounds or I weigh 80 pounds. Now I'm in trouble because all I can do is find a way to get that barrel under control. And the only way I can do that is right here. I gotta pull it around, we've all seen that. So I'd call that more of what we call the idea of a negative uppercut or losing it, but it all has to do with what we're trying to do. Um, young hitters, I'll keep them right here. Go ahead. Because a lot of young hitters, what happens? Wait. Okay. Uh, digress. Weighted bats. Coaches, you guys using any? Why? Well, I found it to make it so, like with a heavy bat, you have to be on time. And <coughs> with a heavy bat, you need to use your whole body, which takes a lot of the front side and a lot of the stuff out of the way. I would so, agree, I see, if, yeah. So I, not for like bat speed or anything, yeah. like just to make it so it's tough, so you gotta... If you've got the right move, this way it. If, and I, it really exposes you if your moves are bad. Exactly, and that's why I see a lot of people just trying to train, and I think they all thought, if I swing a heavy bat and I start swinging it, I'm gonna get better because I take a lighter bat and I think great that. All you've got is upper body move because mm -hmm. your body will recognize its weight and heartbeat and how are you going to control it. If you know how to use your legs, we'll do a little bit of heavy bat training, we'll put a weight on the bat. Mm -hmm. But that's got to be a hitter that knows how to use his legs to, to handle the weight. Because the minute they're down their legs and they're trying, it's going to be a complete. Right. The worst thing you can do is train an upper body swing. I found that it's a way that hitters can feel some things um, and you don't even really have to tell them. And so we don't do it like all the time, but. Yeah. You, you, it stands out for a guy that's late and doesn't necessarily know he's late. It's like, hey, swing this, and he's got no shot. Or someone that isn't using their lower half, they're just... So see, uh, and movement's all based on balance and stability. And the minute I start feeling unstable, two things happen. I'm not going to get a good swing once my brain starts going. It starts pulling the flag. we got a problem here. <laughs> you know, Me and my brain, we've been together a long time. And I can tell, like I said, I can tell, look, I'm going to put my head over, we're not going to fall over, and it doesn't believe me. It said, no, I don't believe me. It just fired all these muscles, right? So we talked about that earlier. There are certain things I don't have any control over, but I do have control of maintaining it. So ideal posture doesn't necessarily have to be stiff. Posture, as long as I fall into a couple of categories. If I've got a shin angle, I want, I'm going to have a spine angle. I want to keep that heel down. I want that heel to control my move. I want to feel that back side create my move. And I want to have space. Even up here, I can have space. A lot of guys can start here 
and come down if they follow the same rules of thumb. Whether they, I doubt if they even were taught spine chin angle, but their body said, this is where I want to work from. But also what, what if you can't feel your heel? Where do you go? You just go up, go to the knee, go to the inside thigh. You got you to feel the heel. Okay. That's the very basis. Um, because you, anything you start landing on top, it's like we talked about picking up the foot. When you felt the knee, you really disconnected from the foot. But you've got the foot, it's just a completely different feel. I know it's odd. That's where it goes. But um, there's times we do play with foot placement because a lot of times some guy works well from here, some people work really good from here. You know? And some guys might work better from here. There's no there's no rhyme or reason. So if the hitting coach say, you know, try to open up a little bit, see how that works, you know, and they say, Oh yeah, man, I can control my move. All right, they can start there. You might find later they can come back here because they've learned to start it. Some guys go invert. It's it's whatever works for them, but they kind of have to feel that. Little things, yeah, what a difference, you know. The um, other trick we have for pelvis is, it's kind of one of those things that's more common, so what I'll have a guy do is, I'm just gonna anticipate that most kids get in a setup and their back hip is off. So I tell them is, just shift it that much, that much. It's not a big move, it's just shift a little bit, find the glute. And that puts you where you're supposed to be. Try to succeed with this kind of outrageously heavy bat. Well, you can't. You try to hit some balls to the, try to drive some balls, and they're like hitting it to the L screen. Right. right. Look, you're not maximizing what you have. Okay. Like I said, as long as it's not long term. But like I said, I see a lot of these people that are just, you know, okay, you know, 80 reps with a heavy bat or different weights of bats. Um, that doesn't create bat speed, by the way. Yeah, you're not for that. <clears throat> You know, and I hear all these things like, you know, I'm not trying to be like that guy, but it's like, that's not going to create mass speed. And what I want to do is anything I work on, whether it be in a drill, whether it be in the gym, whether it be in front toss, flips, DP, anything, I want everything to translate and kind of build that machine that we're going to use, but with all similarity. But like I said, there's too many hitters already upper body. You know, in fact, I'd say once again, Look at all the things that they do, they become that the only thing they have is their body because their body has to work right. They, uh, you know, it's like a lot of the, some guy did a study on the Dominican kids versus some American kids, and he found that the Dominican kids didn't have big APT issues because they don't have video games. So I'm not begging on video games, but how do you play a video game? You're kind of slouched in your seat, right? Well, the other thing is the seats, like in Dominican, the kids are on really low seats. So they don't get an opportunity to sit in the chair in class like this. And you see that bend? Anterior pelvic tilt. So what happens is it affects movements, it affects nerves, um, and all that stuff that sounds funny. Um, Craig Hyatt, you know, one of those, a guy that just does so much by putting all that stuff out, um, is working with his son, and he found that his son couldn't make his move, he just could not control his move. And he talked about it and then he went to a chiropractor and they talked about lumbar four and five and nerves and they did some stretches and all. And he said, here's a kid who on day one could not, could not control his move forward, just could not do it. Could not even feel it. Did all these stretches and everything else, suddenly, oh, there it is. So don't, a lot of this how our body gets conditioned in the moves we make. And that's, like I said, what we talk about. All these little things, you know, where our hand positions are, and they sound really intricate, right? But as you start getting with hitters, and they start getting better, you're gonna see those little things. And you say, hey, uh, take the bottom hand in a little bit. You know, get that better. And some of you say, oh, wow, big difference. Um, where are you at, Doug? Hitting yesterday. Had one little fix. What did, what did, remember the little fix? <clears throat> My hips about that much. Just yeah. Twist them about yeah. half an inch. Can you, can you show us? Yeah. Go ahead and show, you gotta show us where you're at. Try to go the bad way first. So it was right here, and the fix was literally this. Okay. Because see how he aligned everything? Where he was before going back to back way. See what was happening? And the minute he did it, what was the difference? Oh, easier to get space and shoot under. Yeah, boom. 
So we look at all these little things and realize we can put our body in any contorted position we want. And we're going to try and figure a way to get the result. But when we're looking at taking hitters and making them better and, you know, preparing them to be high-level hitters, because that should be our goal. You know, we're talking at lunch where not everybody's going to be a big league hitter, but why would I teach them anything but what I would want to expect from a big league hitter? And what I really hate, I cannot stand coaches go, oh, yeah, that stuff you teach, that's good for the big leaguers, right? You know, they're big and strong. They can get away with that stuff. Like, Are you serious? They face the best pitching in the world, night in, day in, day out. And you're telling me they're going to be able to do something that's wrong? No. The same aspects work for all of us. You know, um, that position can change for hitters anywhere because some hitters can carry this fine. Some hitters, that might be too far down the line. But I know what's not going to work is here. And one of the things you look at, the other thing happens when my back goes down, what's my front elbow doing? Up. Where's it going to go? Out. It went up. Guess who got engaged? Front shoulder. What's it going to do? Take over. That front shoulder has probably 12% of the strength that I have in the rest of my posterior chain. But the minute this happens, the other 88% is just dust in the wind. Because this is going to make a move that this no longer exists. It's just not there. So we look at just trying to get hitters even 50, 60, 70% more efficient, and they're going to see things happen. And then they can start building into more and more strength. Um, like we talked about, hitters always get told, get in your legs. Okay, you need more legs. And the simplest thing is, okay, then get out of your shoulders. Because a hitter cannot be in his shoulders and be in his legs. One part of our body is up, the other is down. All right? And the other thing we've learned is that the core is not meant to be rigid. The core is meant to be flexible and loose. Right? So when we get real tense and try to tighten up the core, we just need to be soft, not one thing, soft, relaxed, so it can work. Because what's the core supposed to do? Connect the two pieces. And remember, some of our big muscles here are part of the core as well. We want all of that working for us. And in too many cases, we're working all those ends to our body to do what we want to do. Uh, so far, so good? Any questions? Fire up, far away, fall back.